Welcome everybody to the Propeller 2 live forum. Today is March 10th, 3 p.m. Pacific. And today is the Spin 2 Beginner Series with Johnny Mack and we're talking about stepper motors. So we'll be seeing some stepper motor basics today. We'll be making some signals, turning a motor, and then creating an object and then learning about another function of smart pins. So along the way, noobs like myself will start programming the P2 on our own and may not even need Johnny Mac much in the future. So wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> the stepper motor is really a, a tool for us today. Um, we're not creating a six axis CNC controller where we're throwing away the computer that's running Mach 3 and replacing it with the P2 just yet. But that's coming too, I'm sure, because I've already received such- um, Two weeks. Yeah, <laughs> see in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so in the near future. Um, while people are loading in still, we had quite a few registrations somewhere um, north of 60. So we'll, we'll just wait a, a few minutes um, to get the files. They are right here and I'll paste them into chat. So some people are building the circuit. Let me just go back for a minute to. Ken, did you get the direct link that I sent you? I have it, yeah. And I'll okay. post that. So if you're building a circuit and you have one of these stepper drivers or more of them and motors, um, you're welcome to run the code with us. And that link is now pasted into the chat. John just posted a few minutes ago. So go there and grab some code. We know this all takes time to get set up. And I pestered him at noon saying, send me some code. What are you going to be showing? Because I want to be setting this up and be there too. So I know it's important for people just to get started and have some time. And it should be near the top forum threads at this moment in the Propeller 2 forum if you're just browsing there. A um, little bit of marketing activity for you. So we started a big sale today, uh, 10 to 40% off various parallax items. And um, it's not on the home page, but if you browse around or you just type in slash sale, you will find it. And there's some good stuff in there. There's even a few P2 goodies to um, inspire some, some new P2 users. Um, one of them is a Johnny Mac and the P2 Edge is on a discount. So good stuff. And this is really important for me because I have about eight Johnny Macs here and eight edges. <laughs> <laughs> because I refuse to tear them apart. <laughs> it's one benefit of working at Parallax. I think I have more than Chip does. So he gets by it with less somehow. But I don't like to tear down the circuits that we build for quick bites and other things. Because I'm always changing them and people are always sending in new code. So this is your chance to spoil yourself with a little more hardware. And John, I think you'll be showing this picture, right? Yes. Okay. We won't. I also included that PDF in uh, one of the archives so oh, that good. people have it on their desktop and can see it really clearly. Okay. So when you grab that zip, like John said, there's a picture and you should be able to figure it out from the code constants too. So yeah, I think it's in, in the archive that's uh, prefaced to 03. That's great, John. This really, really helps. Makes it a lot of fun to have circuits and code and be able to do stuff. I mean, look where we were a year ago. We were all figuring out how to use Zoom. <laughs> so, um, oh, and if you'd like to, like, like I'm going to do in a few moments from Parallax, I'm going to make a deposit in the bank of Johnny Mac because if we do this, he keeps working for us and not for somebody else. And his code saves so much time. <laughs> this is worth more than a cup of coffee or sushi or whatever. I mean, John, I don't know what you're looking forward to in next month, but it's probably watching Formula One races, right? Race start started. So you'll need some um, takeout food to enjoy it fully. <laughs> <laughs> okay, live from Hollywood, California, I present to you Johnny Mack. Hey, hello everybody. <laughs> oh. You guys can unmute yourself and share if you want. It's all okay now. Yeah, uh, you know, we're all friends, so just chime in, speak up. Um, you know, this is, I am so looking forward to this silly shutdown stuff being over so we can get together, you know, at Parallax and have another propeller expo and do this in person yeah. until we can. Um, you know, listen, I, 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 I live here in Hollywood. I'm an unknown actor. So that means I have really skin. 
Uh, so speak up, chime in anytime you want. Uh, I won't be offended. Uh, really? Can we disagree with you? Let's keep it on topic. You can if you're willing to, if you're willing to fight for your position as strongly as I am, yes, you may. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I say this all the time and people know me, you know, I perhaps have a strongish personality, but I, I always say I reserve the right to be wrong. And if you are really articulate with your argument, you may get me to admit to that. <laughs> Colors many, have, many, many people have, trust me. Uh, <clears throat> all right. So, you know, Ken and I talk frequently and part of the, you know, part of what we're doing with this series is to help people get going. And uh, a lot of the, you know, I, I like probably many uh, on the call today, spend a good deal of time in the forums. For me, I was telling a friend yesterday, the forums are for me kind of a morning warm up. You know, I get a cup of tea, go for a walk, and then come back, and then I'll spend some time in the forums because, as I said in my very first presentation, if I can help somebody, they benefit, I learn something, and it gets my mind going. And, and I don't have any stress about what's happening because it's not my project. I'm just helping somebody out. And oftentimes, you know, I think I've said this many times, like for me, if I get stuck, I will go do something else technical to just continue to be productive. And oftentimes in the middle of doing something else, the idea comes to mind and away I go. Yesterday I was assisting uh, Mike, a uh, guy named Mike on the forums. He was trying to get um, SBUS stuff, which is a Futaba serial. And it's on my list to do because again, you know, Hollywood, one of my buddies, Rick, many of you know him, works in special effects. He's working on that show, The Mandalorian, and he's working on two more Star Wars shows right now and he's building creatures and building robots. And they, I don't have one close, they do all of their remote control with uh, radio RC controllers. And he wanted to, uh, he wants to be able to take a standard Futaba receiver, take the S-Bus output into a propeller two, and then do control aspects of the, whether it's a, a droid or, an, uh, you know, he does creatures. So for example, if you saw, those of you who saw the Mandalorian, uh, there was a, a husband and wife fish couple, they're frogs, sorry, the frog people. Rick did all the mechanics inside the heads for the frogs. And that was all articulated and, um, you know, uh, propellers were involved. So um, anyway, uh, going to the forums, I, I noticed a, a thing that came up when I was helping, uh, you know, or, or having this discussion with Mike. He originally titled his topic, I'm not so smart with smart pins. And smart pins do stump people a bit. Uh, there are, you know, 30 some odd modes, 31-ish I guess, uh, uh, and the documentation right now is engineer-ish friendly, not very new programmer friendly. And, you know, you figure things out and sometimes you have to read things over and over again. And, and one of the smart pin modes that I'm gonna talk about today, we've actually discussed, but we kind of just blew right past it. We said, yep, here we're doing, we're doing this. So we're gonna talk a little bit more in detail because it will, it'll help us today. Um, so it's going to be easy. You know, I'm looking at the clock. I have a big clock right here on the desk. So I'm try to keep this so the East Coasters aren't too late for dinner. And, uh, you know, we all walk away happy. So, all right. I guess I should start screen sharing, shouldn't I? Mm -hmm. I think we even have some Europeans too, John. Oh, good. All right. So yeah, we definitely thought that's really fantastic. And Team Oz too. So they're just- I, I, I saw Lachlan earlier. So, you know, I, 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 I'm a little worried because that guy's really, well, there's a lot of really smart people, let's face it here. So I, I have to be careful not to step in it anyway. All right. So we are you're talking- too, You're too late. Dinner's already started, John. <laughs> 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 okay, Jim's already eating. Good news. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, we're talking, you know, spin two and this <laughs> gentle introduction to stepper motors. Now, stepper motors are a special kind of brushless motor. 
Uh, they don't have contacts between the stator, which is the stationary portion of the motor, and the rotor, which is the rotational part of the motor. Um, so again, the, the rotor, the spinny part, that is a word, why is it not <laughs> is is magnetized. And then the stator is, uh, oops, it has, has misspelled coils. Uh, that, and what we're going to do is we're going to sequence those coils in such a way that we can cause the rotor to follow the magnetism of the, uh, the changing magnetic fields in the coil. And that's how we make it move. Pretty straightforward. We, the, the motors we tend to use, you know, are, we think of them as, as four pole. But if you're a drone flyer, like I, I am, you know, you have an Elevate, um, those have, those are also a kind of stepper motor. They're, 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 they have a different setup internally, but it's the same kind of thing where we're doing this, this moving magnetism to move the rotor. So again, we, we will sequence the coils to produce motion. Uh, if we stop sequencing, the motor stops. So we can move to a point and then stop and it, it'll hold there. So there are, we're going to talk about really simplistic stuff that you can do with, uh, you know, with pins on the, you know, the propeller and a, an appropriate interface between the propeller and the motor. Please, for heaven's sake, never connect any kind of inductor, which is a coil, directly to a pin to, uh, of the propeller. Now, when I say inductor, I mean a big electromagnetic thing. Um, so a stepper motor, for example, a relay, for example, don't connect it directly. The reason is that, you know, we build a magnetic field into a coil. When we turn the coil off, the magnetic field collapses. Um, and think of it, you know, as you're blowing up a balloon, you know, it has energy in it. When you release the end of the balloon, that, that pressure blows out. Well, that's energy in, in an electromagnetic, in an in in electromagnetic field, when that collapses, we induce a current the other direction in the wire. It's why you'll see on relays uh, and things, you'll often see a reverse bias diode um, to clamp that. Um, so again, no big magnetics connected, electromagnetics connected directly to a propeller output. Use FETs or transistors or package device like for a stepper motor, a really simple interface chip that I have a schematic for I'll show you. It's called the L293 very easy to use. Um, it will protect the propeller and provide you the current that you need. These things require a bit of current, especially when they're under load. So in, in the simple coding that we can do with using direct outputs and simple code, um, there are, are three kind of styles of controlling the, the motion. It's called wave, full, and half. These are, are steps. And, and I'll show you that here in a second. Once we want to do finer control, then we get into micro-stepping. So micro-stepping is the ability of a controller, like the little board we're getting you're using from Pololu, that will allow us to move to a position that is in between the normals motor, uh, normal steps, uh, hence the term micro-stepping. Now, the controllers will determine how many micro steps that you can have. Uh, this one, for example, will allow you to have up to 16 micro steps. So you can have full steps, half steps, quarter steps, eight steps, or six, and, uh, go to 16. And, and that's the way I've got mine configured today with 16 micro steps. Um, just a word of caution, if you look through engineering documentation, you, the, you can lose a bit of torque depending on how fine your micro steps are, so be, be careful. The other thing too is that, uh, and you'll see why in just a minute, when, you're, when you're, you're trying to go in between these positions, accuracy can, can suffer if your resolution is too high. Again, these are probably for the more high-end uh, things. I was reading some engineering documentation a few days ago. So just be aware of that. I don't think we're going to have any troubles with what we're doing with this small stepper and a small controller. So here's a diagram. This is a gross simplification of the system. We're going to treat the four wires that go out to the stepper. You can see there, there's four wires on here. 
uh, as coils. We're going to think of them this way. And then the rotor we're going to think of as a magnet with two poles on it. Now, if you actually pull apart a, a stepper, you're going to see a ring of teeth, and then you're going to see uh, somewhat matching teeth on the rotor. So there's lots and lots of those poles in there, and there's some offsets in there that give us the ability to do half stepping and, and those kind of things. So again, this is a just a very, very simplified set of diagrams to show you the process of stepping. So here's wave stepping. We turn on a pole, you notice it's a little bit reddish, so that's, you know, we'll call that the south pole and blue is uh, north, so they attract each other. Now, if we turn that coil off and turn this one on, it's going to cause the rotor to turn. And, you know, we can do that. And we, the, the, the way that, that we get to the next step is just turning off one magnet and turning on the other. So you notice in this, Case okay, so we're getting what we call they're we're getting full steps, but we're only using one one coil. Another way to do four steps is called full stepping, and this will help us to understand micro stepping a little bit. So you see here we're turning on two coils at the same time. So what happens is that the the rotor wants to balance itself in between those two operational coils. And so now we turn on these two and these two and vice versa. And again, the, the direction that we want to move uh, gives, uh, tells us which sequencing to use on the coils. But I want you to remember this when we talk about micro-stepping in just a second. And here's half-stepping. So you notice there was, there was only four steps here and only four steps here, although they were, they were at a 45 degree angle from the other one. Well, now we can kind of combine those and we can get what we call half stepping. And so here's, we're in this position. Now we go a half step to this position by using two coils. When we turn off the A here, then B wins. And so it moves and we go around. So you'll see in a half stepping table, and we, we use tables because uh, it's a really easy way to send the outputs, you'll see one bit on, then two bits, one bit on, then two bits, et cetera, and you go all the way around. So going back to this, in the, with micro-stepping, it, it, it's really quite complex, but the easiest way that I can explain it is that in this particular case, since we're just using on and off, we're not doing anything fancy, the rotor wants to balance itself between these two poles, and, and we're going to assume they're of equal power, so it's, a half, it's halfway in between. With a controller like the A4988, it can control the power of these two coils in such a way that it affects the angle of the rotor. Does that make sense? So instead of them being equal, if one is stronger than the other, then the rotor is going to want to you know, be near the stronger. So there's a balancing point there. So it's, it's somewhat complex, but it allows us to improve the perceived resolution of the motors. So for example, this motor that I have, the one we get from Amazon, has normally, if you're doing it as a single step motor, 200 steps to go one revolution. By enabling 16 micro steps, so that's 16 steps per normal step, now it takes 32 steps to go, 3,200 rather, to go one revolution. Okay, make sense? It's, all right. If you do want to play with a motor and, and play with the coding directly, it's quite easy. And I, I'm providing the code, but here's, whoops, what I was talking about a moment ago. So here's a very standard motor driver chip, the L293D, uh, and it will allow, you know, has four inputs and it has four high current outputs. You can use this to derive, to drive rather, uh, um, uh, uh, unipolar or bipolar. This is a bipolar motor. Uh, unipolars have an extra uh, common on each coil set. 
And uh, the nice thing is the enable will allow you to disconnect the output. So it floats the output so you can turn the motor and not have it locked in place. All right. Okay, easy so far. Remember, chime in anytime because uh, I'm all alone here. There's nobody cheering for me over in the rafters. Okay, so this little dude, the A4988, which is this chip here uh, in this nice package, gives us the ability to do micro-stepping. The great thing about this is it really simplifies things since we don't have to deal with tables anymore to, um, to, uh, to work with the code. And, uh, in fact, I should probably go to the other code first, but we'll, we'll finish this. All we need really is to configure it for the, how we want it to step, whether it's a full step, half step, or whatever in the micro step range we want, enable it, which is done by default, and then provide it a direction input and then a pulse. So each time we pulse that step pin, what happens is it moves to the next section. So if we want the motor to turn fast, we put a very short delay in between pulses. If we want it to go slow, then we put a long delay between pulses. Uh, easy peasy. Hey, John. And, yes. One of the things that I, I think you might mention is that um, on your example, you show that uh, your poles are always pulling one pole of a magnet, but by uh, reversing the, vol the uh, current going through the other coils, those can also be pushing as well. Yeah. So it is possible to have uh, a stepper with uh, full uh, current going through all four coils and being part of the operation of the stepper. Yeah, and, and thank you, Ken. Again, that, that, those diagrams are really gross simplification of the mechanics of the motor. If you look at the mechanics of the motor, there's a lot to it. And I thought, yeah, we don't need to go that far. The point was to show how we can do the different stepping. But you're absolutely right. In fact, there are coils that are opposite of each other and wound in such a way that they are pulling from both sides. I have a question. Mm -hmm. With the normal H bridge, can you do what you're talking about, Ken? Um, yes. With, with an H bridge, as long as you've got the ability to reverse the currents going through the coils. Yeah. Okay, so the H bridge, I'm trying to remember, it, it just, well, it can pull high or low on any given, on any given pair, right? Yeah, but right. You, you actually need two H bridges, Chip, because you've got two, two coils. You know, a single H bridge will give you forward and, you know, it lets you set the two sides of a motor either positive and negative or negative and positive. That's right, right. However, ma however many phases of the motor that you've got, you need to have the ability to uh, run those uh, currents, both positive and negative, to be able to do that. Yeah, so you see, you know, here, this has two of those circuits in, so there's an in A and there's an in not A, and in, which is the other side of the coil on it. Oh, a okay, all right. And, but you notice, so there's really, there's two H bridges in here. I've, in, in this case, the way I've used this chip when I've played with it and used it, in fact, we had this on the, one of the boards that we did, either the, the Stampworks board or uh, maybe the original propeller board. Anyway, if you tie the enables together, so you notice there's an, you know, there's two, I just tie them together because in this case with a stepper motor, you know, it's one unit. I don't want to, I don't want to enable one side, not the other. Okay, so just an H bridge, the idea is that you just have a single set Right, so it takes two H bridges to make two. Yes, yeah, because yes. Okay, so every, pretty much every step, I mean, you could run a DC motor forwards and backwards with one H bridge, but mm -hmm. you need two H bridges to run a stepper. Yes. Yeah, if you look at, at, at again, going back to the L293, because it's a real pop thing, you can run two DC motors on a robot with the one chip because it's got two H bridges in it. Um, but you can only do one steppers. If you wanted a stepper robot, which, you know, some people do, you'd need either, you'd need two of these. Because you have the four wires to the, to the coils of the stepper. Is it practical to like PWM the enable me? 
I've seen people do that. I, I, I haven't, but I have seen people do that. And I've never, you know, this is one of those things where I want to sit down and have lunch with somebody and, and, and see why they would do it that way. But I have seen circuits and people using code where they'll set the directions based on the input and then PWM the enable. Uh, you know, you enable, could do that when in a you servo. Just, pardon? You could do that in a servo for current feedback. If you had a position like an encoder to read back the position, mm -hmm. if someone starts to torque on it, you know, and turn it, you'd up the current to bring it back to where it needs to be. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I got into parallax years ago with the uh, uh, Ubicom's chip where I, uh, I had to take a, uh, a DOS system and turn it into a Windows uh, driver where I didn't have uh, full control of the uh, time slice. So I turned an SX chip into a driver for a uh, two and a half axis uh, uh, CNC marking system. Oh, you can make a full driver system uh, out of the uh, four IO lines and a uh, and uh, four transistors. So uh, it's very it's very easy to do that mm -hmm. and. Now that's a unipolar driver. Yes, that means yes. If you've got voltage going into one end and all you're doing is controlling the transistors turning on uh, each yep. one of the phases. With that, it's very easy just on and off to get um, uh, full and half stepping. Yeah. But if you'd like to try micro stepping, then that's where you would get into pulse width modulation of the transistors that are uh, how how much they're being turned on to control microstepping. And that, that's what the A4988 does, is it PWMs the outputs. Uh, you know, so uh, if you think of it, again, you know, in, in terms of conceptually adjacent coils, the, the position is dependent on the, the magnetic strength delivered to the coils through the PWM to those coils. The only reason for doing the um, reverse current is just simply to be able to get more power out of the one motor or one drive system. Right, yep. Or maybe to accelerate or decelerate it really, or maybe decelerate it really quickly if you need to. Right, so it's yeah. Say it's spinning, yeah, to actually to push, push against, actually, right, you can actually push against where, uh, where the coils are, or where the rotor is headed for. Yeah, you can, you can stop it that way. Mm -hmm. So for those that have the uh, this module, here's it, it's. I find it's easier to look at a, a diagram like this than to look at a photograph. It's just clearer. So this is how Ken and I have hooked up the the module. I don't have the pin numbers on here, but I'm using pins eight, nine, and ten for the step direction and enable. Um, with this device, the enable is optional. Uh, I like having that on there. And uh, you'll see we're going to uh, talk about the starting point of a, of a object for this, this device and, and the enable pin. I show how I handle it uh, where for it being an optional parameter. You, so you always have to have step and direction pins. There's no two ways about that. But you don't have to use the enable pin. Now, these three pins right here are, they're, they're labeled MS1, 2, and 3. That's some micro-stepping selection. Um, just for simplification of today and, and the example, I've just connected them directly to 3.3 volts. So I have it selected today for 16 micro-steps for normal step. Um, the reset and sleep pins are connected together to keep it out of reset. Sleep on this module has a pull-up. And so the recommendation from Pololu is if you're not going to control the reset externally, just tie it to the sleep pin so that connects it to that pull up and, and keeps that, um, you know, tidy. The, the nice thing they, the, with the way they laid out the board, I, I, I think, is that you'll notice all the low voltage control is over here and all the high voltage stuff is here. So this is logic power, which can be three to five volts. Uh, I'm using 3.3 .3 on, this, on this rail. The, these are the coil outputs. Again, using this, um, this um, motor from, uh, from Amazon, um, doing that. Uh, it comes with a nice four pin female socket on the end that is 
thank goodness, correctly laid out for this driver. And what I did is used one of these, I don't know if they'll show the, these male, male uh, things for, you know, taking a female socket and sticking it into a breadboard. So that's how I have mine plugged in. I think Ken probably has a photo or a video of his. And then I'm using a 12 volt motor. So I have a 12 volt power supply coming in here. Now Pololu makes a, a bit of a deal in their documentation about the capacitors that are used on this board can be a little sensitive. And so they suggest putting a 100 microfarad capacitor on the power input. So I've, I've done that too. So that's what this is, is a, is a 100 microfarad at, at uh, you know, I recommend at least twice whatever your input voltage is. So that's, that's how we're configuring this, this driver. So let's, let's go back a bit though, and let's go back up to here and look at some really simple code. So the first module. Oh, I got a question for you about your yes. system, John. Yeah. Uh, I have a, some other diagram from some other vendor that has, like it's a, it's a copy of this circuit, but they have the, the logic. You, you have your, your uh, 12 volts supplying both the logic supply and the motor supply in uh, in your diagram not this one but the uh uh this one the, yeah uh the other yeah right so you're, no, you're supplying no. 12 volts is coming to this pin only so here's oh, my it. 12 volts and it comes down and it's going to the positive side of this capacitor which comes into the module right here so that's the only place the 12 volt goes and then the ground Ground is oh, common. Oh, got it. I got it. You made common, a common ground for your power supply. Okay, I have like yeah. this serious floating ground problem here in this this location. So I, so I, I isolate all my uh, my signal, my five volts from my twelve volts. Okay, understood. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, and and, and this this rail, which mark you know positive here. I didn't I didn't mm. put a jumper on here. I should have, um, but this rail internally in the breadboard is 3.3 volts. I'm grabbing off of one of the headers. It comes from Got it. one of the regulators. And in my setup, because of, you know, there are, are four 3.3 volt, or four, eight 3.3 volt regulators on the, the edge, uh, I don't tie them together. You know, on, on the edge breadboard, there's a second breadboard module here. I do tie the grounds together across here, mm. but not the 3.3 volts. Mm, of course. It probably okay. wouldn't hurt anything, but uh, I, I just don't like to tie positive regulators together in case there's an issue. But you can. But you're okay with putting the common ground for your 12 volts and your signal, just because your uh, your supplies are all using a common ground, I guess, right? Yes. But yeah, I have like I have like a floating, uh, yeah, flo different floating grounds in this location. So it, ah. I've actually like messed up stuff by connecting grounds together. You know, I, I, I will admit that, that I didn't try it without, I mean, I could have probably connected this ground directly to here, but the Pololo diagram that I looked at, you know, their recommended connection, it seemed to indicate that that logic ground and this ground are common. I could be wrong. Okay. okay. Oh, that's good. To, uh, I'll think about it. I'm now, pretty sure they're common inside the 4988. Like, if you tap the grounds on the little board, you would see that they were continuous. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, uh. So connecting them externally is not doing anything harmful. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and it looks like Roy has this hooked up. I'm looking at his screen yeah, and I, I have it hooked up this way and Ken does and it, it is working. And it's running okay. your code too that I just okay. downloaded. Oh, you put the fast, or oh, did I leave that in or may, oh, I forgot the- This is oh, number four. Well, well, oh, that, that's why, because I, I put it in there. Got it. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So, again, backing up a little bit, because I kind of blew right through all my slides, uh, but let's go look at, at simple code so that we can see how, how, you know, this idea of turning on the coils. And so what, what Ken and I have done is connected LEDs. And so what I'll probably do is ask Ken to share his screen here in just a second so you can watch this. But this is a really simple program just to demonstrate how coils are sequenced. 
Um, if you had a stepper and a driver, you could hook this up and, and it would operate. But, you know, I, I've got the, the timing set really slow so that you can see the LEDs operating and, and see how those steps happen. Um, and this is, again, with my style is I tend to sneak up on things. I can't ever remember writing a program where I sat down and started a file and then, you know, it grew and grew and grew and grew and then it was done. I always build something here and then build something there and pull pieces and then ultimately get to the point. Um, it, it's just, for me, it works out really well because I'm doing things kind of discreetly. And when I know this works and I can build something else and then I can bring them together. And if something goes wacky, I know it's just the interfacing because the, the parts have already worked individually. So this is why you see these little chunks of programs. But here's what I was talking about a moment ago, where when we're doing simple stepper control, uh, and like you know, Ken was discussing where you know we have these four outputs that we can run through transistors or FETs or an L293, you know, we can very easily accommodate them with a table. Now, you'll remember back in my simple diagrams, we had two of the you know, the the uh, the wave in full had four steps, and then the half step had eight. So you can see what I've done here is I just repeat the, the uh, elements in the table, you know, for the wave and the full steps. That way I always know, I always have to deal with eight units in my table going forward and backward. It just simplifies things. I don't have to think, oh geez, this is a, a four step table. It's, it's, it's eight bytes to do that. And it probably would take more code to do the conditional stuff with different size tables than that. So um, that's just a, a, a way to simplify things. So we look through, then it, it's really quite uh, easy. What we're going to do, this particular method called do steps, you take a number of steps, the direction, which mode we're using, and then a delay, which is how long to stay on that step. And what we're going to do is write to the coils, the step, our current step from the table. Easy peasy, and then we'll hold on to it. And if then there's any, if there are any steps left, then we'll move the table pointer to the next one. If we're going in reverse, we'll subtract. If we're going forward, we'll add. Uh, the nice thing is we don't have to worry about this, you know, this uh, um, uh, prefix negation rolling to a negative number because as soon as we and that with seven, which is what that is, it will clear out all that negative stuff and we're back in the table. So that means we go from zero. If we subtract one from zero, we get negative one and now we end that with seven and we get seven. So that's how we get from zero back around to seven. Uh, same thing uh, here, if we add one to seven, that gives us eight. And now when we mask off everything above those bits, we're back at zero. So it's really easy table navigation, very simple stuff. One of the things that I should point out that I neglected to is that the add pins um, feature, I don't know if it's correct to call it a function or keyword, but it works in constants too. So here I've made the decision, when I do my stepper projects, I have a base pin and then, and then the next three pins I'm going to use for my stepper outputs. It makes it very easy to do this table driven stuff. So I've created a constant called coils. It takes my base, which is an in, you know, one of my pins and adds three to it. So I have a group of four pins that I can write coil values to very, very easily. Um, in fact, much more easily than in the, uh, the, um, the uh, P1, because here we just use pin write. Since coils is a group, uh, it will write four bits from this position. So in my case, I want full steps to be the, uh, to be the default mode. So you'll notice, and this is uh, for new people or people haven't used case, um, you know, I'll test the non-default modes first, and if they don't work, then I will just, I, instead of putting SM full here, I put other. So if there is an error, you know, in the, in the declaration of mode, then it will just assume you meant full steps. Now, 
uh, other programmers may take a different approach and say, hey, that's, that's not a valid mode and just exit out. That's another valid thing. I, I tend to do it this way. Uh, I'd certainly be, uh, there's probably opportunities where if, if there's a bad input, you should just get out. So, Ken, do, can you run this to see blink? Yeah. Do I need to stop sharing? Oh, oh you. I yeah. can take it away from you. <laughs> Ken has the power. I can cut you off anytime. <laughs> Is that working? There we go. Just let me hit enable there. You wouldn't believe the trouble I had with PST on three monitors. I had to shuffle <laughs> things around and use my main monitor to make this work right. So you notice it's doing half steps now. You see there's one on, then two on. There's a wave, right? Again, with full steps, there's always two on. With half steps, it alternates between one and two. So, you know, consider these LEDs, they are, you know, the, the energized coils, which this is what's causing our motion. Now, the faster those change, the, the faster our motor is going to move. So in this case, if you know, you, if you if you put, uh, oh, I'm, I'm moving my mouse as if you can actually see my cursor. But if instead of having those LEDs in there, you had FETs or NPNs, or you could control the coils of the stepper and it would move with this code. Unipolar would. With a with a bipolar motor, you have to be able to change the polarity. That's why you, you need an H bridge whenever you're using a bipolar motor. And so again, the difference is a, a bipolar motor like the ones that we're using have four wires. A unipolar will have six. And you can see, I'll show you when, when uh, we come back to me, in the documentation, the motor manufacturer shows you the, you know, the, the, uh, the difference. All right, back to you. Okay. Yeah, so if we look here in the, the, the documentation, so this is what we have. We're using a bipolar. So we have to be able to change the polarity there. In a unipolar, notice that there are these additional wires. And so with a unipolar, we can use a very simple output again, FETs or transistors. Um, you know, ULN 2803 kind of things, all very, very simple stuff. Okay, and, and again, you know, I've said many times, you know, get the documentation because I, I thought, oh yeah, how many steps are in this? I'm used to motors that have fewer steps. So this particular motor that I have has, uh, where it is, 200, oh, that's not it. Oh, sorry, it, it's, it's, the step angle is 1.8 degrees. So that means there's 200 steps, full steps in a single revolution. So it's something we'll want to know as we start to play. Okay, now, once we've seen how coils work, you know, we can put together a, a, an object. Now I'm kind of skipping ahead. I'm, I'm gonna be like a Quentin Tarantino movie. We're gonna go forward and backward in time from time to time. Um, but so this is a very simple demo of a, an object that started with the um, P1 and it translated really, really simply to the P2. I'll compile it so I can open up the, um, the object. In this particular case, um, this was my first attempt at separate motor control and to be honest with you, I don't know what I've done right or wrong. It works and, and I've done some simple things with it, but I'm, I'm hoping that the motor control experts will help me out. Now in this particular case, that stuff that we were doing now runs in its own cog. So we actually are starting a spin cog to run in the background. Um, none of this stuff is, is terribly fast, so we don't have to do it in assembly. And it will run this code here. So see, there's the same table we were just playing with. Here's the stepper controller. Um, so it will, it will check the enable uh, input to see if we need to enable things. Uh, and that, that's dealt with on the fly. 
you can command the motor to stop. So this section of code, so I won't go into a lot of detail, but this just allows you to, to stop the motor and when it releases because of a foreground command, then it will continue moving. And this loop will say, if we have steps left, you see this is just like we had done a moment ago, we're going to grab, we're going to output to the coils um, and uh, you know our step index. Now in this particular case on the setup, the first program is just an experiment. So we can willy nilly change whether it's wave mode or full step or half step. When you're running an application, you're going to do one thing. And, and so when on, on the start method for this, we actually will tell it what kind of, which step table we want to use. So you can see in the program, the, um, based on that input, we point to the table that, that the user has selected. That's why down in that, that stepper code, it's using byte and then p table. So it's, it's pointing to that one table the entire time of the application. Uh, but again, doing the same thing. If we, are, our, um, if we have steps left, then we will delay for that step period and then change the update the step. In this particular case, uh, I have a variable called step direction. So that's either gonna be plus one or minus one, but this index works the same way. So this really, really simple code and, and what we pass across to it are, are things that allow us to do, here's just raw steps and we can do n number of steps in this duration. So that's another thing to do. Here's do the n steps at this RPM setting, move this degrees again, all it's basic math, even I can do this math. Um, what we're ultimately getting down to is, is running this steps method, which wants to know how many steps and how long in between them. And then that sets up the variables that are used in, in the background. Hey Chip, I have a question. If, if I do an absolute on neg x, what do I get? Let's see, an absolute on neg x. Uh, let's see, neg x, what is, oh, okay, so neg x is the, it's 8,000,000 in hex, right? It's yeah. the maximally negative number you yes. have. So if you did a negative on that, you get the same thing again. I should make neg x like 8,000,001 ,000 hex, because then it would be complementary to pos x, which is 7f, ff, ff, ff. So that if you were to negate, to negate 8,001 hex, you would get pos x. But right now you're not gonna get that. You're well, get or, or make abs, we'll do that because I'm doing that here. So if you, you know, in a lot of programs where I'll say, hey, do something forever, I can either use pos x or neg x. But in this particular case, because we're, we're, we're setting the, the direction based on, uh, on the, the, whether it's a positive or negative integer, but in case somebody passed neg x, I'm, I'm manually converting that to pos x. That caused me to think about that, but then. Yeah. So you better say if it, if it equals neg x, just. Uh, I make it pos x. Oh yeah, 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 that's okay. Positive that's steps right. for the program. Oh, okay, I thought you were negating neg x. I wasn't. No, 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 no. No, okay. because that would create a problem. I think yeah, I that one do, yeah. But then I thought maybe you know is, and maybe that's for the best because you know if you think about it, if it was a signed byte, it would be negative one twenty eight and positive one twenty seven would be the bounds, and and so if you said with a signed byte, take the absolute and it became one twenty seven, that would be a bit of a surprise. Okay. Yeah. Um, this hit me last night, so. Um, we probably don't have to go through, but but you can run these on the LEDs too. In fact, I did. You can actually see how you know, how fast things change. But it's it's more fun to run the the motor controller. So we'll talk uh, a bit about that. You want to take a ten second look at it, John? Yeah, sure. Why not? Right. Can use a bit of a break. Take a break. Get something to drink. There we go. Oh, I have to enable PST. Oh, that's better.
Yeah, I think you know, what's happening is because of the video latency and frame rates, it's mm. the LEDs to look funny because they, they actually move much faster if you if you do this uh, on on if you if you're looking at them. But again, if you uh, if you hooked up a, a set of transistors or a simple driver, you could you could run a unipolar stepper with, with that code. All right, but now let's talk about the. Uh, oh, let me share. We'll talk about you know using the uh, A forty nine eighty eight. Again, here's how how we're we're connecting. the The key inputs are going to be step this white wire and direction. Uh, if you use enable like I do, um, be aware this is an active low enable. So you'll want to make the enable pin low to, to make the chip operate. If you take that pin high, it disables the output. Uh, step is, you can also think of it as active low because zero goes forward and one goes in reverse. And then the step input just needs to be a pulse. According to the documentation, uh, the minimum pulse duration is one microsecond. Uh, I think, you know, given wiring and, and paths and that, uh, you know, probably should be a, a little more than that. Um, I, I did some experimenting to see how fast I could get this to, to go before failing. I never got to the point where it would, but then I didn't want to push it and break something right before the presentation. Um, and so we'll, we'll Talk about that. Talk about why you saw in in uh, if we do if we look at program three rather. Let's start there. Program three will will just grunt mode the the driver. So we have the three pins that we're using: the step pin, direction pin, and the enable pin. Those are all going to be outputs. Um, we're going to drive the, the, if we're using it, drive the enable pin low so that the driver will operate. We're going to, to go forward, we're going to uh, take the direction pin also low. And now, as I was saying earlier, this motor has 200 steps per revolution in full steps. And I've got my driver chip configured for 16 micro steps. So that's 3,200 steps for a single revolution. So this loop, this repeat loop of 3,200 will run a one revolution uh, in this configuration. If I change the micro step uh, inputs, then, then I would get a different number of rotations. These three lines, this is a very grunt mode pulse. I'm taking the step in high, I'm waiting 10 microseconds, and I'm taking the step the pulse pin low. And then in this case, I want, I want that to rotate in about two seconds. So I divide two seconds in microseconds by what's left in 3200 after I've got rid of that. And I will get the rotation in two seconds. Um, I put this pause in here so that, that I could, it, on, on the motor, it has a nice flat mating surface for nicely made motors. And so I, I let it stop so I could put a pencil mark underneath the flag. I, I, you see, I have a, a painter tape flag on mine uh, as Ken and, and I can see that Roy has that on his as well. So I could mark the stop point when it was stopped and then watch and it would come back and make sure that it was dead on. Um, simple stuff, but massively entertaining for a goofy person like me. Now, if your code looks like this, should so this will go in reverse, but here's where I was trying to test how fast I could do the pulses. So if you if you do this, you know, this leaves this delay unchanged. If you change this to one, you've now divided the step delay by two and you'll speed up the period. Uh, he'll speed up the rotation. It'll go twice as fast. If we go two, it will go four times as fast. Three will go eight times as fast. And 16 will go uh, 
pardon me, four will go 16 times as fast. That's where I stopped. It, it you could barely see it go around. So um, uh, while Roy's running a different program, or Ken, can you, can you share your screen and, and show, uh, change these and then rerun the program a couple of times? Yep, here it comes. Speeds? So again, this is showing the, the basic behavior of a stepper motor when we are moving, the rotational speed is affected by the delay between pulses. This is where video is going to kill us to you. <laughs> I'm not doing much for you, is it? Yeah, yeah. It, <laughs> okay. it's, it's, this is where we're getting the wagon wheel effect that you get <laughs> when you get the, 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 uh, this, the shutter and the wagon wheel uh, synchronized with each other. Well, uh, I'll ask you to trust if you change that, if you do uh, shift right by four bits, so that's dividing that time by 16, um, that goes around, you know, really fast. And, and I think uh, um, I figured it out. It's roughly 50 kilohertz, the pulse rate to the motor at, at that point. Now, I didn't see it in the, in the documentation, the simple documentation they have, but I'm trying to figure out if the manufacturer of this motor has a maximum coil change rate. This is where my lack of mechanical engineering skills are, are, are showing. But it seems like the motor manufacturer would say, listen, don't try to change the coils any faster than this rate. I kind of snuck up on it and said, okay, you know, at, at 50 kilohertz roughly, you can't even see the flag move on, on you know, when looking out, it just goes zing and it's back to that, that place. And then it goes slow and then zing right back. So, hey John, yes, you are. Um, every stepper motor is going to have a speed that um, um, it gets up to, and then you can't push it any faster. Right at the particular voltage that you're at, but okay. there are there are ways of increasing the voltage uh, so that it saturates the coil even faster, and that's what the high end motor drivers do. Is they'll put out like even four to 10 times the rated voltage just for oh, wow. uh, microseconds. Yeah. And that's how you can take a stepper motor that normally wouldn't go, you know, 10,000 RPM. You kind of shock it with a super high voltage and then drop the current down so that you're not burning your motor up. And mm -hmm. that's how they get uh, stepper motors to go real fast. Oh, got you it. Know, that speed limit is probably due to some reluctance in the coils in the motor, sure. right? Yeah, right. They can't yeah. unload fast enough. So, yeah, if you actively unloaded them, I could see like, so Ken, you're talking about shocking them with high voltage, but could you, is, is that the way to do it as opposed to like collapsing them with a negative pulse, then driving them in the next mode? It, it kind of depends on what you're doing with, uh, with that energy. Um, the way that uh, stepper motors uh, years and years ago, before they had all the fancy micro-stepping uh, capability, the way, uh, what they did was they ran normally a four times voltage. Let's say that your motor was rated at five volts, then you would run uh, uh, 20 volts into it and you would, you, you would uh, run that through a uh, uh, current limiting resistor. And that current limiting resistor still allowed the motor to fill, feel the, uh, the 20 volts. However, it kept the current uh, uh, from burning up the coils of, of the motor. It was really wasteful in terms of the, the supplying power to, uh, to the whole thing. But modern uh, steppers, what they do is they have uh, multiple voltages that will feed just for a few microseconds at the beginning of a step and then drop the, the um, uh, voltage and current down as it's actually in motion. I wonder, that makes me think, could you do something like, if you want to run the motor at a, at a speed, a certain speed most of the time, could you put a capacitor across it and develop like a tank circuit? It would have to be, well, it would have to go AC to do that. No, I, I wouldn't think that it, um, I wouldn't think you'd be able to do that and still have the other advantages of a stepper, such as you know variable uh, variable speeds on it. But one of the things that um, uh, is some of the motor drivers do is they actually harvest 
the energy that they're dropping off of one coil and they use that that, that current to drive the next coil through. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, some kind of e right. energy recovery system so right. you don't have such continuous draw. I also right. noticed I was helping someone with something to do, had a stepper in it a couple years, about a year ago. And we found that once you move the stepper, you can cut, you can cut off the supply. If you sit there and dwell on, keep those coils powered the whole time, the thing gets hot and wastes lots right, of power. Right, right. But um, once you move it, you can stop it. Uh, almost all, once you're at a, a your next position, uh, almost all your modern uh, uh, drivers will allow you to drop to in some percentage of uh, current. So where full current might be, let's say two amps running through uh, the coils, once you're stopped, uh, it will go ahead and drop to maybe a tenth of an amp or whatever you need as a holding amperage. And that's a real good way to uh, keep your motors cooler. Can, can I ask a question on that? It, if you're micro-stepping, you have to maintain a certain current in each of the coils to hold position, don't you? Yes. So if yes. you drop the current, won't you slip to the next sort of integral pole? Um, only, um, it, it, you can do it with a percentage of current. So if you have like, um, let's say that you've got one phase that's got 10% of current and the other phase that's got 50% of current, then you could drop those, uh, you can then go ahead and drop those to 1% uh, of current and 5% of current. That'll still hold the same position, but cut the overall current going into the motor. So it has to be proportional. Right, right, right. If you're going to, oh. especially on microstrip the stepping. Hey guys, so, just while, while we're talking current, I'm interested in the correlation between noise, the, the typical singing note the steppers give off relative to the current. I know you can get trinamic drivers or whatever um, you, you can configure to keep them quiet. How does the noise play to, to the current side of things? The more current you, you, you run through, the more it's going to act like a speaker. Um, however, the, um, the micro-stepping is a big part of what takes your, uh, your noise of a, a stepper motor down. Instead of it uh, uh, hitting a position and kind of resonating, uh, micro-stepping is uh, a way of cutting the overall noise of the motor down as well. Right. Yeah. That's they also cut, out, cut down the noise by uh, the PWM frequencies that they feed to right. adjust the voltage percentages. Higher frequencies will be less audible. So anyway, Johnny, uh, John Mack, uh, I, I uh, edited the number three program to do the shift up by two, so it's running a lot slower on my view. Oh, I, don't know if that, I, I was doing the thing that you wanted Ken to show where yeah. I, I shifted those numbers up so that the delay is longer, so it's spinning around slower. Right. Now, what I was, was uh, maybe I, I misspoke. Uh, if you do, I was explaining right shift to Ken to do a division. So I was in, in my normal setup, I had forward in two seconds, and then I was returning in a quarter of a second. But the, the, the lesson was to, to, you know, especially for the newcomers, there's clearly a lot of people that know far more about steppers than I do in, in the class today. But the, the correlation between the step delay and the speed that the, the motor is turning. Then we get into really complex things that I'm, I'm hoping to learn is, you know, we get into acceleration curves and deceleration curves. And I've done that with DC motor control. Yeah. Some of you may remember my friend, uh, John, who makes, uh, uh, John Huffman, who makes, uh, who owns Johnny Jib, makes the camera platform stuff. Um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, he was showing uh, one of the camera platforms that was used at the Super Bowl that we, uh, you know, John built the mechanics and I, I did the electronics and coded. It's got a propeller in there. And he, he actually just sent this motor to me. This is probably more in line with what, what Ken was talking about. Um, this is a big industrial motor that also has an encoder on, on the back. Uh, and, it, and, you know, it comes with, uh, you know, a fairly sizable uh, controller that I haven't had an opportunity to play with yet. But 
this is an interesting thing because it it we we have this stepper which theoretically gives us control but you can't have you know you can't i, I guess in in a um a high quality situation you can't just simply count on the steps that you've sent because if there was a slip or a problem you'd have an issue but here this has an encoder built onto it so we have a closed loop so it's, Here's where we think we should be. Well, here's where we actually are. You know, makes it into a proper servo. Yes. <laughs> yes. But you know that 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 represents the marriage of two separate systems: the stepper driver and an encoder. So yeah, yeah. What, you can see there's two wires on it. Right. It's got that's like two two different ideas put together. But can you look at the okay? We're controlling the stepper field, the 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 coils, right? Can you feed back from the coils and tell anything about the position of the stepper and then just integrate a count? No, I don't think so. But, but Ken Bash seems to know a lot about these things. So hopefully he'll save me here and have an answer. <laughs> I don't think um, what? the, the, the uh, motors for the uh, uh, three, fa uh, three phase brushless motors do uh, exactly that. They would they feed back the a uh, voltage that uh, detects how much how much uh, current is in each one at uh, any given period of time. The I will I will say that the adding the encoder into that motor does in fact turn it very closely into a servo into into speeds almost like the DC servo. Years and years ago, uh, I was using CompuMotor regular stepper drives on a uh, CNC router I built. And I got, let's say that I got 10 inches per second on the motion that I could uh, get out of the router. Well, they sent me a set of uh, motor drives exactly like what you've got in your hand that had the stepper drive and an encoder by Knowing where the motor was, it was possible to change the timing of the steps, similar to what advancing the timing in an engine does, the, in, a, in a combustion engine, so that the reluctance of the motor, the time that it takes to fill the coils and everything, that that is compensated for by, uh, by, uh, with the encoder and knowing what position. It allowed me to increase the speed of my router by a factor of five. Wow. So if a stepper could do it at 2000 RPM, the stepper with the feedback could do it at about 10,000 RPM. Hmm. But you did need a, you did need the encoder. Right. Neat. Okay, John, where were we? Uh, we're gonna talk about smart pins a little bit. And by the way, Ken Bash has made the six axis, six axis controller we were talking about earlier. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll be sharing it at some point on the forums. I, I would I would say to Ken then what I said to John Titus a couple of weeks ago, why aren't you teaching this class? <laughs> He's got a lot to share pretty you're, soon. You're, yeah. you're much more pretty than I am. <laughs> oh, no, I know. Come on. You're a handsome devil there. And, and, yeah, and you got Hollywood in the background. I can't, I can't compete with that. <laughs> I actually live on the other side of that hill. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, where's my share? So let's talk about smart pins because as I was saying, you know, somebody started a thread in the forums the other day saying, I'm not so smart with smart pins. Uh, a mode that we kind of glossed over when we were doing the, uh, the flash is the, the pulse and cycles output. Uh, mode uh, of, of the smart pin. And I've been using this lately because I'm writing a couple of, of hobby servo drivers and I'm working with the, I don't have it on my desk now, the, the Feedback 360 and the standard and, and uh, this comes in handy. And there was, as I was saying to Ken earlier, you know, there's, there's the documentation is kind of written from an engineer's point of view and there's little subtle details in there. And, and a couple of weeks ago, I, I I read something, then I went back and said, oh, wait, <laughs> that's meaningful. So normally, in the way that we're going to put it together here with, with the, with the to, to configure the pulse pin, uh, well, let me back up on smart pins. Remember, 
with smart pins, we have three registers that we're going to set up the smart pin with. We might not use them all, but but they're available. So we'll have the what I'm going to call the the the, the mode register, then X and Y parameters. Uh, if a smart pin, like say UART or DAC or sorry ADC, gives us values back, that comes from its internal Z register. Now. The smart pins, uh, many of them will split up the X into kind of 16-bit groups. And this is a case for the, the pulse output. So there's really two modes with, with pulse output. There's uh, cycles, which is how I'm normally going to use it. And then there's the, the single pulse output. i explain the difference. We're going to use the low word of X. And, and this is to give us the period of, of a single pulse when we're doing the cycles output. So it's going to go high and it's going to go low. And the high word of X is how many ticks are in the low period. I tend to, to set this up very simply so that I figure out what my period is for a pulse. And then the, the high word of X gets half of what's here. So I get a 50% duty cycle. Now, again, one of the things that I had blown right past um, was that if you if you set this X uh, word one to zero, then it never goes low. And, and now you can have longer single pulses. You can't have a train of pulses, but you can have longer pulses. So I'm using this, for example, in my hobby servo driver where I wanted to have fractional microseconds so that I can do rate control going between positions and uh, when I'm saying I want to move from here to here and I want to do it in this much time, the intermediate steps may be a fraction of a microsecond. And now with this, I can. For our case, we're going to use it in, in, uh, in standard modes. Uh, so we have a high and a low. And what I'm doing is I'm using what I, my, I'm assuming is my maximum rate you know, for the, the servo in, in Hertz. Uh, that's going to determine my, my period ticks, and then I'm going to set it to a 50% duty cycle. When we want to run a set of pulses, then, um, then we stick that into the Y value. And as a reminder, smart pins use the, the direction bit of the pin as, a, as an on-off switch, if you will. So we have to add the output enable flag to the smart pin configuration so that we can actually send the pulse out um, because, because you know, writing the thing high and low is, is what's actually turning the smart pin on and off. So if we look in, you know, we were just looking at in, in, um, in program three, we were doing, you know, kind of grunt steps. In program four, um, this is, my starting point for an object. And, and, and when Ken and I were talking a, a week or so ago, or some at some point, he said, you know, people are struggling learning how to write objects. So I, I did this as a partial program. So it's not a complete object by any means. But what I wanted to show you again is my process and whether you use it or adapt it uh, or something that we say today as a group inspires you. This is how I do it. When I want to create a new object, I start with my template, which you know everybody has or you have access to or create your own template. And then what I will do is go down to the bottom and I will you know, mark a section saying anything from here down is object code. Now, I'm initially putting it into my main, my main test file. And so, here and what I've, I've done is I'll usually put a an underscore in front of my method names. This is a reminder. Hey, these are going to go outside later. Uh, but I will develop my methods for the object in my test file. It just for me it makes life easier. I don't have to worry about you know connecting the files or doing all those things. I can just do it in one space. Once all of this code makes is happy, I will resave the entire thing as the object file name. Then I'll rip out all this unnecessary test code for you know for the object, clean up the name stuff, and have the object in place. 
So I know I talk a million miles an hour, but hopefully that made sense. This is my approach to doing it. Instead of starting with a test file and a, an object file, I just do it all in one place. It, it makes, for me, it makes my life a little easier. Um, but uh, you know, the, the part of the doing this series is to encourage everybody to write their own objects. You know, lots of us on, on, on the uh, call, you know, are regularly contributing. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, for those of you that haven't yet, you know, put an object out in public, you know, challenge yourself to do it. There's probably something you know or something you want to know um, that you could learn and then, you know, provide the object. Because there's certainly there is never, we're never going to run out of people saying, hey, where's the object for widget X or widget Y or widget Z? People are always looking for objects. Um, you know, you'll, you'll learn a lot in the process. So this is a starter for an object that, you know, hopefully in a month or so, or, you know, whenever we, you know, have some consensus, will be a nice little driver that will do lots of neat things. So you can see I even put my to-do list in here. These are things that I want to do is add, you know, add in the things like I had before, like the how many steps are in revolution, what my micro step setting is. Um, before I was doing it manually, I knew I had a 200 you know, revolution, uh, start, I had a 200 step per revolution motor and I have my micro stepping set to 16. So that's in total 3,200 micro steps per revolution. I should pass that along. So it should have parameters for this and this that I pass to the start method so that I can um, embed that total number of steps because that would then get me to the point where, okay, I, if I know that I have 3,200 steps in 360 degrees, if I want to turn 90 degrees, it's a simple matter of math to figure out how many steps that I need to move. Uh, I okay. did that uh, here, just haven't done it there. Yes, sir. Um, have you had a chance to look at the code that I sent to Ken? Did, uh, did Ken uh, send that to you? I've not seen it. Not yet. Okay. Um, I want you to look at it because uh, as a start for uh, controlling something, what I, what I have is uh, the code to control uh, six axes of uh, step and direction, and it'll generate speeds up to, I think, 20 million pulses per second, wow. somewhere in, in that neighborhood. And uh, it's basically an object that uh, does already have uh, not just go this way or go there, turn left or turn right, but you tell it uh, the exact position for all six axes of motors and it drives uh, all motors. So like for instance, in the camera, uh, camera system that you wanna, have multiple axes uh, uh, so that you're staying focused on one point as the camera moves. It's already got that in there. Plus it has the, uh, it keeps track of where each axis is. Now it's a little bit overkill for a single axis. However, um, to be able to say for one motor, if, if I'm only controlling one motor, all I do is just set up the X axis as that motor and tell it, okay, go to position 500, go to position 12,000 and so on. And it zips back and forth to it. It's probably worth looking at as a start for a uh, motion control or the, the stepper motor uh, uh, function. I definitely will. Again, the, the goal of today, so if I wasn't clear is let's just make things move. You know, right. get, right. get things hooked up and moving. I, and it, it often, you know, and, and I see it with, with friends a lot, you know, I'll give them a schematic and then they just go, you know, do not pass go, do not collect $200. They don't hook something up correctly and smoke comes out. And right. <laughs> so I, I, I am, I admittedly, I'm an old lady trapped in a medium aged body you know I oh, no, well, very I think specifically and slowly because i love this stuff i treasure my i you know this board has my autograph on the bottom i don't want to break it um you know this is a nice motor i, I don't like destroying things and I, I get really disappointed when i do and, and i have you know many times so uh, well, i think i think one yeah. of the things that i want uh one of the reasons that i uh I gave this 
this uh, software to Parallax is that it will allow uh, Parallax to build the drivers without uh, without having to have a polu board in the middle of it. So all you okay. need is the intelligent control over the transistors and the P2 should be able to control uh, micro, resolu micro stepping steppers and so on very easily just with uh, control of the transistors. So I'll, I'll let you get on with it and, and be quiet, but do look at it because- I, I, at I will. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, I, I, you know, I went hunting around the last couple of weeks looking to see what people are doing out in the world. And I found one project that was mildly interesting. You know, it was a hobbyist project where a guy was doing a, a G code parser and then moving three steppers with it. And that, that was something I started to play with. And um, because that's another, another, you know, a topic, you know, doing, uh, it, it would be fun. I mean, the culmination of all this is, and, you know, maybe, with the what we can learn from your code is to be able to build say a, a three axis controller um you know which is you know fairly straightforward perhaps you know right. that we could you know it'd be fun to have a, a little desktop unit where we could control x y and z axis um, well the next uh, I'm, I'm already doing that uh, i was doing that with the p1 i've for 13 years i've been using it as a uh, controller for some of um, my multi-axis systems. So easy, uh, easy, easy to do. And the P2, uh, big reason for uh, offering it at, to the group here is that the P2 will have the capability of, of uh, being a DC motor driver as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, I've already done that. Yeah. Well, they, well, the nice thing with, is, with, sorry. Uh, anyway, it will it will be able to do uh, uh, six axes uh, control of DC motors with encoder feedback. Neat. Hmm. Quick yeah, comment. My, my, go ahead. John. Yeah, so I'm sitting on Ken's work right now and waiting to get some MOSFETs so I can actually use it a little bit. Um, and then I'm planning on putting it out there, but I think it will lead towards the, you know, the CNC control that people are right. after. So he's been gracious in giving that to us. John, I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, you were talking about your process to develop an object and how you start with it all in one file, then you, you're identifying what's going to move out. Mm -hmm. Do you think about it differently when you're going to be putting that in another cog? Do you still develop the same no. one? No. Yeah, I still do it because, um, because remember, we're, we're always with, with an object, even code that's going to run in another cog, we have we have the spin interface and, and then, you know, we, we might then have a method, well, uh, you know, at some point that puts code into a cog. And, and I, I will say, you know, cause I've written thousands of P1 programs. I have uh, many programs that I, I, I in, for me, I call them embedded objects. Um, so again, I, I'm always waving this board around, but, but this HCA board from EFX tech, I have an embedded object that really only applies to this board. It's not universal. But this has specific IOs and some things that it does. So I have in my template an embedded object that, that spawns off a cog. Because it's specific to this board, I just build it into this board template and I, I, don't, I don't move it outside. But most of the time, uh, what I'll do is, you know, from, from this point down, I will keep and what I'll do is go all the way up to if you've seen my objects, I will, I will keep, you know, for example, this set of pins to, to remind myself, hey, don't, don't use these pins. These are fixed within the ecosystem. Um, you know, this would come out because the timing is controlled elsewhere and we're not using a terminal. See, for me, it's, it's perhaps it's lazy. I don't know. I, I just don't want to have to fool around with a, a secondary file and where it's saved. I can get things working and just focus on the process. Once it's done, then I can, you know, do the cleanup work. Um, some people may, may, may take a different approach. I just don't want to be flipping back and forth between files when I'm really, you know, in a groove. So is the is the cog the new cog basically the main cog top file when you're developing then? I don't is that well. So when you put things in a cog, you're doing it because they they're taking up time timing or resources yep. and yep. So when you're developing before you 
launch those objects in a new cog, you're using your main program. Oh yeah, yeah. The, the 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 code that launches the cog is down at the bottom with all the other, you know, object stuff. It, it operates the same. I mean, if you think about it, it's it's a big package of code. Uh, when yeah. we to be able to to use it in a lot of places, we put it into an external file that is you know compiled and then linked into our project. But we can't have all that that code inside, you know. And so I just start there. Uh, for me, it is just an easier process. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, this gets in, oh, the, to the easy peasy stuff. Uh, but I do want to show that, that, uh, that setup um, for the, the pulse output. Um, you know, I could probably get away with fewer variables, but I, I like to, I, I'm, an anal retentive nut when it comes to formatting. Um, you'll, and, and you're gonna, I'll ask Ken, you'll hear me, he's heard me complain about bad formatting <laughs> for years. I, I just, it makes me crazy. So I try to be really neat about it. Anyway, M is my mode, we're in pulse mode. And here's that output flag. Again, when we're using a smart pin that is, we want it to have to create some kind of output we must add this flag so that the output can be activated. The low word is the period of our pulse, uh, our clock. So in this case, I'm, I determined empirically, you know, 50 kilohertz. This would probably be another good parameter in a long-term, you know, uh, version of the object where you could pass this, where you can say, hey, this is my maximum, you know, clock rate. Um, and I'm, I'm setting this to 50% duty cycle by taking the period and dividing it by, uh, by, sorry, by two. Remember, this is the number of ticks in the low side of the, the, the period. And then this will clear out anything that was in the pin and start it. You notice a zero in this position. So it doesn't do anything initially. That last parameter is the initial Y value, which in our case is going to be the number of pulses. Now, talking with, with you know, listening to some of the things that, that Ken was saying, you know, you, you could, if you had a motor spinning really fast, you could probably configure this so that you could just put in a number of pulses and then let it fly. But the, the, the trick with this is we only have 16 bits for our period. So the, the faster our clock rate, the, the, the faster that period is going to be. You know, um, hey, John. Yeah. Okay, this mode, this smart pin mode has a base time a 16-bit time base thing that you said also, right? This is it right here. This is the time base for the period. Okay, because if you set it to one, then your granularity is one system clock, but you can, yes. you can set it to a 16-bit number, and then everything you feed it is in terms of that time base. So if you set it to 10, and every, the, you, now when you tell it to pulse uh, for so long, or wait a minute, Maybe this one doesn't have the time base. No, it doesn't. Th this, okay. is, this is the, the period of the pulsing in system ticks. So you have a maximum of, of 16 bits. Um, so so 16 in, my, in, bits. in my case, so that'd be 65,535. In my case, I always run 200 megahertz. And, and so that, you know, I think it, I figured out it's going to be about three kilohertz uh, if you divide, if I divide, uh, you know, my system clock frequency by, by this, I think it's around three kilohertz. Oh, but, oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Because it's 16 bits. So that six, three kilohertz is your slowest frequency. Yes. I got it. Okay. So it does have yes. a time base. It's just 16 bits. It's is not only 16 for... bits. Yeah. So, yeah. so in the P3, make that 32 bits, please. Um, and, uh, um, and so that's why you'll notice here, I'm using the, for, for the new spin programmers, this is the minimum operator and this is the maximum operator. Um, I always do it this way to decorate it. it says, what this is telling me visually is, hey, whatever this evaluates to, 
force it in between two and FFFF. Uh, and it makes sense. This is one of those clever choices Chip made because it's the, the hash symbol kind of looks like an equal sign. So it's, it's equal or greater than two, and this is less than or equal to FFFF. So you notice I put two here because this word is going to take that and divide it by two. So if it was only two clocks, then, then my low period would be, be one, which you know, we obviously wouldn't use for here. Um, for spy chips and things like that, it'd be fine. But this sets up the, the uh, smart pin, and, but doesn't do any pulses. We'll see down here, I have a, uh, a, again, this is work in progress of doing simple, is I wanted to make a simple method just so it's easy to remember, say pulse. So this is gonna send one pulse to the motor and you see what we're going to do. This has already been preset to um, that mode and we'll say do one pulse. The, the Y value is the number of pulses to generate and uh, so it will. And um, in uh, other things, again, when, when you in, in consideration uh, of uh, things, I, I probably tend to go uh, overboard. If I was just starting up a project, uh, starting up the, the program, probably all the pins are clear anyway, but I'm, I'm really, you know, careful about that. So I, I clear the direction pin to make sure there's nothing inside it. And then I, I say, all right, go ahead and preset it to forward. This is a little trick. This is, you know, Ken and I were talking earlier and I'm really stingy about memory and uh, because I started with the, uh, the basic stamp one, which had 12 bytes. So um, I don't need a long to define a pin. Now there is a case though where I might not use the enable pin. Um, I have it hooked up here, but we could get away with running this with just the step and direction. If we, if we pull that wire and, and let the enable pin float on the module, it'll be enabled, it'll be pre-enabled. So I, I say here in, in my start parameter, and this is uh, what I've done, I think others have too. If you're not using that pin, pass negative one. Now we, we can do that. Remember all parameters passed in to a method are those they're always longs uh, and so we we can do that now when i do this assignment here when i say take this and put it into here well this is a 32-bit value from there and this is an 8-bit value from here so what that means is that the i'm only going to get the lower eight bits now negative one we know is all ones and so this will actually be 255. But what I do is, is when I want to check to see if I'm using the enable pin, I, I'm looking, I'm treating this like a signed byte now. And I'm saying, hey, if that bit is zero, then we're using the pin and I'll clear it and then set the enable to true. So that's you know, something that you can do. You'll often see that in my other programs. So if you, I'll see if, I, if it's a, a long, this would be 31. If it was a signed word, it would be 15. Um, a simple thing. So the enable state for this guy, as we said, is active low. So um, we can pass a state value. And here's where I, I'm really glad that, that the, the uh, what is this called, the ternary operator is, is set up. Um, I like this. So I, I, if, if what this is saying is if state is not zero, then write a zero to the pin, otherwise write a one to the pin to disable it. Um, so this will treat any non-zero value as true, which will, eh. I, it's funny, I'm, I'm, I'm considering my choices. Maybe I should call that disable so that if this is true, then uh, I'll, I'll figure that out a bit. Uh, and here's a, a very simple thing that gets things moving. Again, the whole goal of today is just to get things moving. We're going to pass the number of steps, and this is a signed value. So if we want to go forward, we pass it a positive value. If we pass it a negative value, we're going in reverse. Um, and I guess I should check for negax there. I'm not doing that. And then this is how many milliseconds to, uh, to use to do the move. 
Um, and so the first thing we'll do is here's something I was just talking about. A negative value, uh, a signed long rather in spin, bit 31 is the sign bit. So all we have to do is since direction is a one or a zero, we can just pass the sign bit to write it out to the pin because a zero is forward, that would be a positive number and one, which would indicate a negative number was passed is zero. Um, in this, so then once we've done that, we're going to take the, we're going to get rid of the sign by taking, you know, using absolute. And here is going to be our loop timing. So we're, this value is um, giving us the number of ticks in a millisecond. We'll multiply that by the number of milliseconds and then divide it by the steps. And, you know, it's, it's grade school math. And now we end up in a control loop where we start with grabbing the system counter and for the number of pulses that we've been asked to send out we send a pulse and then we wait stupid easy now this would be better off in a cog so in the long-term aspects when we want to do this we send it off and then our foreground code is is ready to do that but again this is the starting point just want to be able to, to make sure I can send a number of pulses and uh, Roy was running this code earlier, saw the flag going back and forth just like uh, it was before, but you can see now it's boiled down to, you know, these lines of code. So we take 3200 steps, which in our configuration is one full revolution and do that in two seconds and then go back the way we came, but do it in half a second. So it'll go faster. Again, we have motion. It's a, a starting point. And uh, that was the goal of, of today, is just to get things moving and, and validate circuits. Uh, I, again, I think it's really important that we take the time to check things one bit at a time. Um, don't rush past steps. Get your hardware set up and then do simple tests. You saw how simple this program three was but that verified that the hardware was working. Once that's done, then move on to the next. And this is how I approach all of, you know, my, my designs, like for my friend John or, or, you know, EFX tech, we'll do a board design while the board is out being made. I'll, I'll write test code so that when the board is back, we can ring out the board and make sure that the board works and that we have any objects that are required to support the board and then we move forward. So it's, you know, very functionally step by step by step. But in the end, you know, now I, I will freely admit, I don't do anything monstrously complicated. Remember, I, I live here in Hollywood. We don't do anything complicated. It's all, you know, popsicle sticks and rubber bands. It's magic. Um, but the stuff that I do has to work. You know, if you're, you know, my friend Rick, again, he's working on all these Star Wars shows. He needs code that's going to be reliable because once you get out on a set, <laughs> especially on, on a big movie or a big TV series, that's really expensive time when something doesn't operate. And so I, I take this very cautious approach just to make sure once it gets out there, it, it works flawlessly and we don't have any troubles. So that's all I had for today. Again, try to, we're, Keep it very easy, get some things going, and uh, I'm, I'm really excited now to look at Ken's code so that I can learn how much I don't know about all of this stuff. Well, if I gave that to you, you would have never made it to today. <laughs> <laughs> this is the point where we applaud, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that was great, John. Thank you. Yeah, it was. Thank you. Thanks, John. But I, I am I am sincerely Ken excited. You know, you clearly have a lot of experience in this, and that's that's I think you know the the benefit of these sessions. Look, I, I'm happy to be a pretty face, as Ken called me, uh, and a mouthpiece uh, to talk to get discussions going because uh, talking is good. You know, we're all locked in our homes, and uh, you know these connections is as weird as they are uh, helps us. You know, I. When my friend was a guy named Cliff Osmond, I've talked about him many times, and he sadly passed from cancer. And, uh, you know, it, it was one of the many amazing things of him is when he was nearing the end, 
it didn't matter that he knew that, you know, it was just around the corner. He still wanted to learn new things. And I, I think that, you know, that was such an inspiration for me, always learning. And I have these ideas, you know, I'm an electronics guy, you know, reasonable at electronics and pretty good at programming, but I want to build things. I want to make things move and I want to build, yeah. you know, neat animatronics. And I want to help my friend Rick and my friends, Matt, when they have to do animatronics and, and this motion control stuff, there's a lot that I don't know that, that I, I want to learn. So I'm glad, Ken, we hadn't had an opportunity to talk before. So I'm glad we did today because, uh, you know, consider yourself a reason. Well, one of the things that I think um, um, is a future that Parallax might uh, look into is uh, additive manufacturing with 3D printing is here to stay and it's the wave of the future. But I also, I think that um, the P2 offers the opportunity to put together probably the most sophisticated controller for uh, uh, 3D printing systems that uh, is out there. And the ability, right now everything's running off of stepper motors and so you get a certain speed. By being able to go to, to DC motors with feedback, it uh, automatically won the speeding up the systems by about a third or so in terms of the traverse speeds get a whole lot faster. So the thing is, is that uh, motion control may be uh, the quote killer app that uh, can put parallax on the on the map in terms of, of selling millions and millions of chips. So I think that that's a, a distinct possibility and I look forward to seeing that happen. Well, you, you know, I, I absolutely agree that, you know, because there's every day there's some neat new, you know, printer. My my buddy you know, called earlier, you know, he's, he just got a new 3D printer. And so there's a driver board in there for that. And it's probably open source anyway. Um, and, you know, it, it at, at right. some point would probably right. be a good idea to grab a popular 3D printer and rip the guts out of it and put a P2 in and, and code it right. you know, so and operate it because, the, you know, it, it, the world wants demonstrations. That's why many of us here today, you know, we're always throwing out demo code and say, look, here's what you can do. Look, here's what you can do. You know, this group notwithstanding, you know, there, there are a lot of shy people in the world. They want to see it. They, you know, they're all from Missouri. It's a show me thing. Once you have an application, a real world thing that people understand, a 3D printer, uh, and you and you do that, um, you know, it, it opens up the possibilities. There are people that still look at the propeller as an oddball. It's a different yeah. architecture. It's a small company versus the big behemoths. You know, you don't, you know, every magazine in the world is wedded to the Arduino ecosystem. And, uh, you know, just a few of us, me and a few others that write about the propeller. But, it, you know, to your point, if you, if there is a, one of those kind of ubiquitous applications and you showed the superiority of the propeller architecture in that application, you know, I, I think it's a big win. And, and I'm, I'm suggesting it doesn't have to be a massive six axis thing, a simple thing that gets the groundswell going will build. It says, I, I always say to my friend, Linda, you know, it's a snowball effect. You've got to, you know, start with a small snow build, but you go up on a big hill and push it off. Yeah. And, Bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. We got to start with the snowball. Ken, I would be very interested in in marrying um, uh, DC motors with the uh, uh, encoders. I've been playing with that, and and it's quite tricky to get the PID type control. So you get real smooth and accurate action and fast. So having an app that you know a, um, an object that can achieve all that is really interesting. Well, I I did this years ago with um, a uh, with a M25 controlling a DC motor with an encoder on it. And this is on the uh, with the P1, and the the code that I've uh, given to you guys generates the uh, the ab an absolute position. Let's say if you say go from position 1,000 to 2,000, it will generate. The, all of the positions that it should be at uh, in between 1,000 and, and, and 3,000. Well, 
if another cog takes the reading of where it should be from millisecond to millisecond and uh, puts that into a, a uh, uh, feedback loop for controlling a DC motor, you actually, you use the basic code of where everything should be as an absolute uh, uh, position driver. And then you use the feedback for where everything is right. and feed that into a uh, PID loop for controlling of a DC motor. With a, and this was not optimized. I, and like I said, using the uh, uh, M25 driver, uh, with a, I think it was a half or a one horsepower DC motor that I was using, I managed to keep about plus or minus 10 steps of a 4,000 line encoder, which for me was, was plenty of capability, but I can easily see this being uh, uh, cleaned up quite a bit to where it would hold into two or three um, uh, positions on an encoder. So anyway, I think that uh, the I think the future is bright for the P2 as a motion controller. Well, again, consider it, you know, with the encoder capability built into the smart pins uh, and the two modes where you get the absolute position right. and the, the speed and, and you don't have to spawn off a cog to get those things. Right. So your, your process cog, your PID cog uh, can pull in, you know, that, that data. Right. That to me, you know, and I, I do these these simple motion control platforms for cameras, and it, it is all very simple control. But you know, in in the past, we we had a lot of cogs running because of encoders and and trying to be very careful. And we we made it all work, even with our simple code, we made it all work really really well. And as I was going through, I was talking to John and say, you know, with the P two, if we move to the P two, we can get rid of a bunch of interfacing hardware that we required because we were doing analog control of some external motor control as well that simplified now and then right. the motor stuff in particular you look at the uh the uh magnetic encoders now that all it takes is a magnet and the chip and i think uh, though i don't know four or five dollar range for the uh, uh magnetic en encoder chips and the resolution is something like four thousand uh ninety six steps per revolution and you combine that that with a decent feedback loop on the P2, and you're going to have a very inexpensive, very capable control system. So, um, I years and years ago, I took uh, an IBM PC and I wrote the the uh, a in, uh, a parser and an interpreter for uh, HP's uh, uh, code for. Uh, Plotter for the the uh, the plotter output. G script is that what it was called? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, HP, whatever, whatever it was. HPGL. Uh, right. Yeah, HPGL. Yeah, that's right. And um, what I did was I took the uh, AutoCAD. I was doing uh, drawings in AutoCAD, and then I would take the output of that and turn it into the step and direction signals. And I've got all that code sitting in, uh, uh, it's all C++ code, but something that we could very easily uh, uh, put into. Um, I, with all the C uh, interpreters that are out there uh, right now, I think that I've got most of the code for a full C, uh, C and C encoder or uh, controller uh, already written years ago. So if some of you other most control people are interested in it. Let me know and we'll, we'll put some of it together. Oh. So again, you know, the demo idea is really good. You know, Chip and Coley and, and baggers are working on this uh, Octocade system where, you know, one P2 is playing eight arcade games simultaneously. You know, that'll be a really cool thing when people at a trade show see that. That's going to be fairly impressive to see eight arcade games running on one edge. So that's because there is a market segment for that to, you know, uh, I don't know. If, I don't know of anybody that wants to control eight arcade games at the same time or personally, but in terms I don't of, either, but I know that they're out there. Uh, and, and the point of it is though, even because it's not a terribly practical example, but right. one of those things that catches people's attention and says, wow, if you can do that, 
then certainly I can do this. That's why, you know, this motion control stuff, it would be fun. You know, Ken is really good with mechanical stuff. Uh, my friend Rick, who I keep mentioning, you know, he's got a full blown shop just two miles. Right. Uh, and so I, I want to build something that moves. Uh, even, and Rick was saying, and, and, you know, this is a bigger project, maybe, you know, out of scope, but, you know, we're manually stuffing circuit boards all the time because we, you know, we're always doing everything with surface mount. And he said to me one day, well, let's just build, <laughs> let's build a pick and place machine. Right. Like, oh, oh yeah, yes. we'll, just, we'll just go grab a six pack of beer and throw it together. Not a problem. All right, John, well, I'm, I'm waiting for you on that one. I've been, I've been needing exactly that and looking at ways to do it. <laughs> so I um, you know, want to ask Ken, are... pardon me, Ken? Good. Yeah. Um, when the P2 first came out, um, uh, Ken asked for videos on machines that were, or on systems that were doing something with the P2. And I sent one in showing my uh, three axis system in operation. So, and, and for a pick and place machine, that's basically what you need is three axes and, or three and a half, you know, to turn a vacuum or so, uh, on and off. But it's out there. So, John. Go look at the code. I, I will. Ken's going to send it to me. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and by the way, I'm not, not sitting on Ken's code intentionally, but when Ken sent his, his code and I knew how much work he had in, in it, I had to go back to him and say, this is serious stuff, Ken. Are you sure you want to, you know, let this out for free, um, open source for the world to take it over? And I had to get that confirmation off. He posted it on his own. That would have been a little different. It's like, okay, he made that decision. But suddenly it's in my hands. I did not want to, uh, you know, release anything um, without his full blessing. But he did give us that approval. And so I think coming, give, just a second. Um, coming from us, I, the intent I had in mind was, and tell me if this is, matching what you had in mind, Kent. I think it matches actually, but to use it um, to spur some real interest. So I wanted to uh, post it with your video as a starting point for some people to pick it up and possibly help us get serious about 3D right. printing and CNC. And that I'm, to me felt a little better than having it uh, just get posted on a forum thread without an introduction. Um, all the people out here have specialties that are way above and beyond what my capabilities are. My ability is in motion control and, and motors and so on. And all the stuff that everybody's contributed over the years has been wonderful. So if this is my uh, contribution to some of these other people that they can make use of it, then all right, it's, this is what this community is about, is about everybody giving to the common cause. So yeah, yeah run with it. Okay, so Monday. And it's interesting, Ken waited around so long for the P2, but he kept developing for it. And yeah, at this point, he's not formally pursuing uh, the code base anymore, but wants to share it. Hey, Ken, I have a question. I mean, Ken Bash. Yeah. Was this thing written in PASM or did you use spin or a combination? It's in assembly. It's in okay. assembly and it uh, fits in one cog. I think it's like 400 some odd, uh, whatever we're calling the 32 uh, uh, bit words. 32 bit words, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, um, there, it has a very simple ramping function uh, for ramping up and ramping down in speeds as well. So anyway, it's there and it's it's ready for somebody that wants to run a little bit further with it to take it. And I'll be happy to answer some questions about what my intentions were with it. But yeah, it's it. You can hook it up to a milling machine right now if you want to. Well, given wow. the efficiencies of of the P2 assembly versus the P1, you can right. probably get, you know, many more features into it if you want it. Right. And I wasn't even making any use of uh, smart pens or uh, a lot of the uh, extra capabilities that's there. Um, John, on the, uh, the table that you throw out there for uh, half full and wave stepping, I don't see that there's any, any reason in the world why you couldn't have a similar table for micro-stepping. 
um, you just you use more bits, of course, for sure. uh, micro stepping. But with the uh, the being able to control the uh, frequency output on the uh, individual pins, um, a micro stepper should be just kind of a given with the uh, the P2 in you know however many axes you got hooked up. But I think, you know, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, you, instead of just a direct on and off output, you want to you, uh, vary the, the power, if you will, of, of each phase by PWMing it. Right, right. And then, and, I mean, the great but, thing is a P2 has PWM per pin, so that's right, you know, pretty right. straightforward. Now, uh, one of the things you have to keep in mind is that um, different transistors will have different... Um, on off uh, speeds, so you'll have yeah. to uh, keep that in mind as part of the uh, the table for your pulse width modulation. But I don't see any reason in the world why the uh, P2 couldn't be the uh, a very nice micro step controller as well. Hmm. It'll be something to experiment with. Yeah, yeah. I am my and, you know my personal goal is to understand the acceleration and deceleration in in a nonlinear fashion. In in my simple camera control projects, I do linear acceleration and deceleration. Uh, then I, I have a friend who, who uh, used to work in the camera department at Disney, which is just over there. Uh, and, um, and, you know, he showed me, I, I was working on this motion platform for a camera and we were talking about it. And I said, look, I, I know I want a trapezoidal kind of function. <laughs> and he said, Here's how easy it is, because I already had encoders built in, and he explained it, and an hour later, the code was working. Uh, but you know, there are people that are doing, you know, like S-curves, you know, in and out to get really nice acceleration. I, I want to start to understand that. And all the code that I write is in high-level stuff, so, you know, it'll be useful for me to look at your assembly code uh, to learn from it. And that's, you know, my, my whole life, and I'll say this for the, for the group, especially, you know, there's probably, there may be a few new programmers in here. Look at code written by others. I have a, a friend uh, that I used to, uh, he, he became a friend after I, I met him through Toro, the company I used to work for, because he was a consultant to the company. And he was, a, he still is an amazing programmer. And he was very generous. He said, look, here's how you do something. And I studied his code and I learned a lot of really neat tricks. You know, I I study Chip's code all the time. You know, having a hard time breaking through some of his stuff because he's from a different planet and he thinks. I've never I've things. never understood any of Chip's code. <laughs> yeah. He just thinks differently than the rest of us. Um, yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it's still beneficial. You know, I I think I probably open the the uh, the uh, interpreter. You know, assembly code once or twice a week and look through it and try to figure out, you know, little things that I'm doing. So again, the, I appreciate, Ken, that you're making your code available um, because that the motion control stuff with 3D printing and other things, you know, I, I am old enough as I suspect you are, Ken, you know, I watched Neil Armstrong step down the ladder onto the moon when it was on TV. And now we have this amazing rover on Mars mm -hmm. It's going to drop off a helicopter in a couple of days and fly a helicopter on Mars. Yeah, that kind of robotics too is fascinating, and there's a lot of motion stuff going on there. So these yeah. things all play into, you know, the stuff. Ken uh, Gracie spends a lot of time with teachers, and those those kind of inspirational things and real inspirational things are important. You know, when when parallax introduced the basic stamp, there were not a lot of choices for regular guys like me who were hobbyists. Um, there, there were lots of SBCs, but none of them were terribly easy to program and you're building your own boards, you know, as you know, 6811s and a lot of other Motorola stuff. And then the basic stamp came out. And, you know, for me, it was a, a huge change because I like basic and, you know, and the thing just worked. So, what I wanted, I hope, you know, my contribution to the community is to write, hopefully, code that is useful to people beyond me, and then also to provide inspiration so the people can say, wow, if that goofy guy from Hollywood can do it, I can do projects too, and, and get people motivated to actually sit down and try. I think that's, what, that's the biggest challenge, is getting people to believe in themselves and that they can sit down and write code and make things work. I think I think what you said right there, more than anything, I'm uh, 
I used to be a uh, martial arts instructor and one of the most important things uh, about testing when people reached a point where there was time to break bricks and boards and stuff like that, one of the most important things was for them to believe that they could do it. And of anything else that the parallax community has done, I think that it's been to enable um, individuals that, oh yeah, I can make this work. And here's a piece of code that I can, I can borrow and put in here and put in there. But that, that belief that, that, that I can do it thing, that's the one thing that we need to be, we, we need to be giving it to all the kids that are out there. Yeah. And uh, I think that that is a, uh, a noble goal. Not yeah. many of us have noble goals anymore. <laughs> Well, I mean, as especially youngsters, I, you know, when, when I worked for Parallax, I, I had some really amazing opportunities to go out and work with, with young people. Um, when I was living in Dallas and, and IBM in Dallas would do this week-long tech session for, um, you know, underprivileged girls, you know, teenage girls, you know, young teens. Yeah. And, you know, so Ken would send me a giant pack of Bobots and, you know, we would go to town and, and, you know, it was really fun to see, you know, these kids engaged in programming and, and learning things, so, you know, hopefully, you know, again, I'm going to sound like an old guy, but, you know, when, when I was a kid, we didn't have video games, <laughs> you know, we, if we wanted something, we made it. Uh, and uh, which is a phrase that my friend Rick used recently, you know, uh, Rick, who I keep mentioning, uh, was giving a tour of his shop at, at a party he was throwing one evening and, and people were going, oh, wow, that's really neat, you know, because he built dinosaurs from Jurassic Park and he had this, you know, model airplane engine he built for all these kind of neat, crazy, fun things. And uh, everybody was really taken aback. And, and he turned to me with this, he has this really kind of impish smile and he says you know what's great about our lives if we want something we can just build it and i want other people to feel that way if you want something you know with a bit of of skills you can just build it and there yep. you go so speaking of we have just given out the first two gifts um Everyone who asks for a gift to go to a student, meaning a robot kit, will usually get awarded as long as it's legitimate. So this will be updated tomorrow, but we've given out two robots to some special kids who um, were nominated by um, one was a teacher and one was a neighbor. So there's a process for it. And we haven't done much with this since we announced it, but it's very easy if you have a student in mind who would really benefit from this or who is interested in this kind of thing and is out running what's available at school or home can't provide it or school can't provide it, whatever, just come in here, fill out this form. And um, it's super easy. We're just like, who, who do you want to send something to and what and why? Who are you? So we make sure you're legitimate and then boom. The end of the month we send out hardware so we've sent out somewhere around four hundred dollars worth at the moment but we're sitting on four thousand eight hundred dollars of hardware that can go out nice. or we're sitting on four thousand eight hundred dollars that really belongs to the community that will become hardware so we don't charge for shipping when we do this we just um in fact even discount the value of parallax stuff so the money goes really far Yeah, we need to encourage more engineers. Thank you, John. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Ken. Ken and Chip and everybody else out there. It was it was nice to meet you. And um, I've kind of gotten away from the propeller for various reasons, but uh, you guys. Come on back, Ken. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Ken, hey. what are you doing? If you're not doing the water is warm, come on back. You shouldn't have said that, Ken. <laughs> uh, I have a fully 3D printable robot that I'm trying to introduce, and the cheapest way to introduce it to the most students was was with the uh, the Arduino. But I do <sighs> have. I do have an optional board for the P2 that can go on it as well at some point in time. So anyway, um, look into my code. Yeah, uh, we'll, 
do what you think about it. And uh, anything I can do to help you go in the right direction, I will. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Well, unless anyone has any final comments for John or questions for him or otherwise, we'll start wrapping up. Um, John, I, I want to say thank you. That was that was excellent today. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, that Steve. was good. You bet. Uh, Ken, one more thought. About getting started. Yeah, it's excellent. A thought about uh, Ken's code. Um, you might just go ahead and put it up the Parallax uh, GitHub repo. Okay. Yeah, and I don't know if I was clear or not, but when someone gives me their code and they say they worked for 14 years on it, I'm usually, I have to, don't want to take responsibility for it, giving away their intellectual sure. property prematurely. <laughs> no, that made good sense. As long as he's willing 